Hello everybody and welcome back to Sumatra on Base. I hope everyone is well at this time. What's prompted this video today is a conversation I had last year with a musician friend of mine. And um, we were playing a gig. He was in the audience and he sort of walked up and sort of motioned me over to talk to me. And of course I had my wireless unit on so I could just waltz across the stage a bit. And, and he said to me, mate, there's something wrong. The speakers, they sound terrible. They're, they're really muddy. Initially, I thought, okay, um, we must have lost the horns or something in the speakers. So I went out the front onto the dance floor, uh, still playing, and they sounded fine. And he was all the time there going, see, it's, it's really muddy. And I'm going, okay, um, I'll talk to you during the, the break. And during the break, we had the, the, um, the background music playback on, so that sounded fine. I waltzed over to where he was sitting, it sounded fine there too. And he was adamant that there's something wrong with the speakers and they don't have any highs and they're muddy. And I said, mate, let's just ask everybody else. So he asked people at the table and said, what, how does it sound to you? And again, it sounds fine. So after a, a little bit of time, the, the penny dropped that actually it was his hearing that was having a problem. And unfortunately he found out he had a high degree of hearing damage and the highs had rolled off so much that everything sounded muddy. Now, with everything else in your musical endeavors, your instruments, your strings, your amplifiers, speakers, if they get damaged, you can replace them. Your hearing is a once in a lifetime thing. Once you lose it, it there's no getting it back. So it pays to protect it. And I've done a couple of videos previously on hearing protection and on in-ear monitors, which are very popular now. And we had a lot of discussions online and I was surprised with how many people actually suffer from, from like tinnitus or you know, ringing in your ear, that sort of thing. Um, it's, it's amazing that, that so many people actually have had some degree of hearing damage. Now, it's natural for you to lose your high frequency hearing as you age but that's a gradual thing and and actually as far as music is concerned you can still hear reasonably well enough into your later years to actually play and listen to it and enjoy it so the national institute for occupational safety and health recommends 85 dbs for eight hours maximum so uh, every 5 dBs then that you add to that, you have to halve the time. So at 90 dBs, it's 4 hours. At 95 dBs, it's 2 hours, etc., etc. So, so at 100 dBs on average, it's a 1 hour is the sort of safety limit for exposure. Now, most bands will be between 100 and 115 dBs. So then it comes down to at 115, about seven and a half minutes or something right so it's not a lot of time um, as that level goes up you you need to cut down the exposure and i have a feeling this is why so many people suffer from some degree of hearing damage now in uh, recent years there's been a lot done for musicians to actually uh, mitigate that risk the first thing we can actually do as as a group as a band is if we're using amps on stage, just turn it down. Turn it down a bit. Um, if you don't have front of house support, um, there's only so far you can go with that. But turning it down uh, noticeably will have a noticeable effect, okay? Now, if you're still playing with amps and stuff on stage um, and you don't have a facility for IEM, uh, and I've done this before, there are several versions of these little earplugs. These are not like swimmers earplugs. If you look at the end of this one, this is a Planet Waves set. There's a tiny little filter in there. And I think that cuts the level by about 20 dB. So if you were playing at 100 dB, and that's safe for an hour, this would cut it back to say 80 dB, and that's safe for eight hours, right? Um, and the way to actually use these, because they feel a bit odd, uh, you must get a good seal, and with the, with the three flanges, it does. Um, but it, the, the trick is to put them on half an hour, an hour earlier, and leave them in. And then your brain 
sensitizes your hearing that little bit more, I think, and you can actually, you adapt to how they sound, right? So the other uh, value of that is that they, they kind of tend to cut out the ambient noise that's further away, like the audience. Also, in a lot of discussion with a lot of folks, a lot of them have gone with the in-ear monitoring route, okay? And then the same thing applies with these. They cut out the ambient noise, so that's reduced. And uh, you can control the level in here. And like I've said before, you can still go deaf using these if you crank them up. I mean, it's little, little speakers, but they're right next to your eardrum. So you want to be really careful and keep those levels nice and low. So everybody asks, well, what is 85 dB? I mean, uh, I'm, a sort of average conversation is about 60 dB. A lawnmower running is about 90 dB. At about 120, 130 dB, that's the threshold of pain. That's like a, a jet liner taking off. And that's a big noise, right? And that's where your ears start to hurt. It's great to either turn down to be able to use the hearing protection to drop that level in your ears, to use the in-ear monitors. And again, that has the added advantage of cutting out the, the ambient noise in the room and giving you a great mix in your ears. But you must be mindful of the level. And if your uh, system has facilities like compressors and limiters for those auxiliary outputs that drive the in-ear monitors, you should set those not so they squash the signal too much because it should be under the threshold of the compressor or the limiter, but in case somebody drops a microphone or accidentally cracks that snare too hard, it limits how much of that gets through, right? It caps it. So that's very important also. I guess the other thing that we've done, um, because now a lot of venues have, uh, and they have had for some time, but they've got a light system that tells you when you're reaching that threshold where it cuts the power to the stage. So it's a green, amber, red. And if the light goes up to that red for more than five seconds, it cuts the power. So people have adjusted their, their sound pressure levels to a more reasonable level already. But in big rooms, you're standing next to that amp. So with our typical stage setup, the stage is at one end of the room. Then there's a dance floor and then there's seating for the audience. So what we shoot for now, because the stage is effectively a silent stage, there's only two small monitors for the vocalist to be able to hear the band. The drum set is electronic, there are no amps, everybody's on in-ear monitors. So typically if we had say 100 dB at the dance floor, and then the sound will drop off through the room. So then we get probably at the first set of tables, about 94. Then you move a little further back and you're getting to about 88. It drops off at about 6 dB over, depending on where you me measure it from, from the source. Every doubling of the measurement is about 6 dB drop. So by the time you get back to the back of the room, it's about 82 dB. It's relatively quiet. If we were doing, say, a show where we're featuring a particular artist and we want the room to hear the artist all the way, then sort of halfway up the room where we find things start to drop off, we put a couple of speakers that are linked to the system. They're on a delayed uh, line, so the sound comes at the same time, so you don't get that, that little echo you hear with the delayed sound from the speakers right at the front of the room. Um, so it's a time delay to time align the speakers. Then that'll drop back to a more reasonable sort of 94 and then sort of uh, 88 and then the other speakers take over and you set the levels and they kind of keep it at that 88 dBs or 90 dBs or wherever you set it for a comfortable level but it doesn't die off at the back of the room which is a another thing to consider. And uh, on, a, on a digital system that's available these days, these things are really easy to do, really easy to time align and, uh, and do all those things. Uh, sorry, and I almost forgot. Um, one way to check these levels is to actually use a dB meter. 
I I have one on my phone. I don't know how accurate it is. It, it's it's in the ballpark. It's sort of in the ballpark, I'm guessing. But you can get uh, a proper dB meter that mounts on the stand. You can put it out there. You can take an average. You can give you peak readings and stuff like that. And then you will know for sure where your levels are at. So depending on depending on the amount of time, you can you can adjust the levels. Now, if it's like a lot of the times. Uh, a sort of production show, a production show that the, the exposure times are a lot shorter. They're usually about an hour, an hour and a half, two hours. There's an intermission of about 20 minutes in the middle, so people's ears get to have a bit of a rest, so it's not as bad. So those shows tend to be a little bit louder than a band that's up on stage for like one and a half, two hours at a time with a 10 minute break in between, for example. So just take all that into account. Once again, thank you for spending this time with me. Please spread the message about hearing protection amongst your friends. And I hope to see you guys soon. Until the next video, keep making music, keep playing bass, keep protecting your hearing. God bless. I'll see you soon.